one. If we could get that up, please. There it is. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Father, as we approach your word, we do with sobriety. We ask that you guide us, Holy Spirit, and illumine us. Because we can see black and white letters on a page, Father, but we need the Holy Spirit to teach us, the Holy Spirit to reveal to us, the Holy Spirit to illumine to us the Word of God. Not that we cast our opinion on it or say things that you don't say, but we want to know what the Word of God says to us and then how we apply it. So help us, Holy Spirit, in this endeavor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Leviticus chapter 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. The title of this um, particular teaching is called, um, not only everything, the whole book is called How to Live with the Holy King. Remember, the Holy King lives with them in their neighborhood. He pitched his tent right in the middle of the Hebrew camp. And the Israelites have to figure out, how do I live with this holy being as my next door neighbor? And God, in order to dwell amongst them, has uh, many stipulations because it says in Ezekiel, he must protect his holiness. And so these laws come down uh, with a view toward how to relate to a holy person. And so that's what we're studying today. So we're looking at chapter 18. And I just want to read the, one of the very last portions to us to see how important this whole section is. Uh, verse 24. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, which we're going to elucidate in a minute. For by all these, the nations I am driving out before you became unclean. And the land became unclean. Isn't that interesting? The land, which is owned by God, can become polluted, and God will do something about it. Hence the book of Revelation. I'm driving those out before you that be, become unclean. And the land became unclean so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes, my rules, and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns, sojourns among you. For the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations so that the land became unclean. Lest the land, ready, vomit you out when you make it unclean. That's repeated in Revelation 18 where God says, get out of Babylon. Separate yourself, lest you incur her plagues. <clears throat> so when we become like the world, we get the punishment that the world deserves in being in rebellion to God. Lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation before you. A lot of vomiting here. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you and never to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. So just a quick breakdown of how this chapter works. Verses 1 through 5 is the exhortation to avoid the custom of the, of the heathens. To avoid the customs of the heathens. Six through eight is a list of unions regarded as incestuous, incestuous uh, family relations. This all has to do with sexual unions, by the way. 19 through 23, other Canaanite sexual deviations to avoid. Other Canaanite sexual deviations to avoid. 24 through 30, warning of the consequences of neglecting these rules, which I just read you. 24 through 30. What are the consequences of neglecting the rules that God lays down to live in, in the same neighborhood with him? Now, chapter 17 opens a new section in Leviticus. We're going to spend a little bit of time in the next two sermons 
about individual responsibility. Up to 17, it was a corporate addressing to all of, is of Israel. Now the microscope narrows down on the individual so that everyone in the camp knows how they're to conduct themselves living with a holy God. So it's not a national address, it's a private devotion that the Lord's covering here, chapters 17 all the way to 24, I believe. The first 16 chapters had to do with corporate Israel. Now, we are taught in seminary that the first thing you do when you exegete a passage is you look for repetitive words. And that sort of gives you a, 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 hat, a peg to hang your hat on to see what this chapter means. Now, seven times in chapter 18 is repeated the phrase, uh, you, that is the Israelites, are not to behave like the nations who inhabited Egypt and Canaan before you. That happens seven times in one chapter, that, that phrase. So God is strict with them, saying you are not to behave like the nations who are in this land prior to you, and I've already told you what happens to them will happen to you if you model your lifestyle after theirs. Six times the phrase, I am the Lord your God, is repeated in Leviticus 18. So it kind of reminds you that the law is given at Sinai where God had to describe who he was, who they were, what God did for them, and therefore, here's how I want you to live. So it's very similar to Exodus 18, 19, and 20. What is behind all these laws we're going to go through in just a moment? Israel is to be a distinct people in the earth. Israel is to be a distinct people in the earth. This is the attempt that the Amish make by their dress and their lifestyle. They, they attempt to be distinct in the earth. Now, God is not just saying uh, you have to have these outward things to, to prove you're distinct, but it's a lifestyle and an attitude and a way of living that makes you distinct in the New Testament. <clears throat> You are not at all to be like the pagan or the heathen nations. They are, the Israel is God's people, and they're not to act or be like the other nations, to copy them in mannerisms, to copy them even down to haircuts. We're going to get soon here in the thing here, which is why you see a lot of the Hasidic Jews today. If you go to New York, for instance, they still have the curls down the side and the hair uh, in a certain style according to the law and trying to be distinct. And they certainly are distinct, but not in the way that the Lord in the New Covenant wants us to be distinct. <clears throat> it's just not clothing at all. They are to be like their Lord. And what is he? In the book of Leviticus, if we've learned anything, what is he? He's holy. And especially in sexual matters. Especially in sexual matters. The Egyptian and the Canaanite Sexual perversions, who they had, they didn't live for any gods except Ra, and uh, he didn't have any laws or anything, so they practiced whatever they wanted to do uh, in terms of um, uh, sexual identity and sexual things. Here's a list of the Egyptian and Canaanite sexual perversions, and I'm going to move quickly because it, it makes me want to vomit when I do this chapter. Uh, brothers marrying sisters. One of the clear ones that comes out here is homosexuality and lesbianism. Ready for this one? Bestiality was a common practice amongst the Egyptians and the Canaanites where worship rituals included women copulating with goats. It actually took place in their worship services. Uh, we're facing an incredible problem of homosexuality even in the Christian church today obviously they've never read Leviticus now understand the mere the, the, the regulations here are based on God's holiness and our desire to live with him and so the, the homosexual community takes a verse here and says it doesn't mean that it means you have to be real love and that, that's not the point the point is how do we live with a holy God and if he didn't put up with it then, he's not putting up 
with it today. I'm ahead of myself with this. So one of the things I have raised with fellow Christian ministers, because I've been involved in a couple committee meetings over these problems, and I'm very, very vocal about this. I've read, so, written several papers for committees, etc., is that you fudge on this issue and you allow people to call themselves gay Christians, the next thing we're going to deal with is pedoph pedophilia and then bestiality. That's where it's going to go if you don't stop it now. But they won't listen because we're supposed to love and accept. Well, God is not tolerant of these things, so you know. You can smile at me. It's, I hope it gets better. One of the other practices of the Egyptians and Canaanites, which you're probably aware of, is child sacrifice. The offering of small children, even newborn infants, to Moloch, the demon god. Verse 3 God says, you must not follow their rules or behavior. You must not. So keeping God's law is the path to divine blessing to a happy and fulfilled life in the present. That's Leviticus 26. When God uses the phrase throughout chapter 18, and you're going to see it a lot coming up before we get to 24, his desire for his people is to experience life. When he says that, he doesn't mean just biological life of breathing and your heart beating. That's not what he means when he says, I want you to experience life. He wants his people to experience a quality of life called eternal life. It's not so much a duration as it is a lifestyle that already and will be. You with me? So I can use those words synonymous, eternal life with the kingdom of God. It's already here in how you're to behave. And then one day you'll be, you'll be in fullness of it. Right? So the quality of life that God wants us to have is the quality of eternal life, which is his life. In the New Testament, John 8, 51 says this, If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. That's Jesus' way of saying you're going to experience a quality of life that will increase for you. The path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter to the full day if you keep these regulations and these things, knowing that you live and dwell with a holy God who happens to live inside of you. I had one of my grandkids ask me, does God see everything that we do? I said, yeah, he sees everything that we do. And I said, it even gets worse. When he lives inside of you, you ask him to participate in everything that you do, which tells me you don't understand who lives inside of you. Everybody okay with that? It got one of my kids saved saying that, so that was pretty good. The next section we hit on is called forbidden unions. I'm using polite language. Everybody understand? For forbidden unions. Verse 6. No man among you may approach any of his close relatives to have intimacy. It seems common sense, but in the Egyptian camp and the Canaanite camp, pretty regular practice. Union with non-Israelites was strictly forbidden. Deuteronomy 7.3. Non-Israelites, you're not to marry an Egyptian or a Canaanite, because they will drag you into their system of life. A man must not marry. Ready? I'm going to go quickly. Verse 7, his mother. Verse 12, his aunt. Verse 8, his stepmother. Uh, verse 9, his sister or half-sister. Verse 15, his daughter-in-law. Verse 10, his granddaughter. Verse 17, his step-granddaughter. All these things, again, the Egyptians and Canaanites were doing quite regularly. Other Canaanite customs to be avoided, 19 through 23. Adultery, which was a common practice amongst them. Wife swapping, things of this nature. Free love, if you will, from the 60s, which tells us we're trying to be like Egypt and Canaan as hard as we possibly can. And then, of course, we all already mentioned sacrifices to Moloch, children thrown alive into the flames. 
Uh, of course, the modern day version of that is abortion, is uh, we sacrifice children 5,000 a day in this nation, which means we're living on mercy fumes. Mercy fumes, do you understand, in this nation? Mercy fumes. So if you're going to pray for this nation, fall on your face and ask for increased mercy because mercy always precedes judgment. Not healthy, not good. And now we've got a presidential candidate that wants to codify it into law for the whole nation. Not good, eh? But the Lord is on his throne and he will visit us somehow, either with judgment or salvation or both. Who knows? But I trust him and him alone. I don't trust presidents or kings or governments. None of them on earth. None of them. Don't put your trust in them. They're temporary. He's eternal. Okay. We have a modern day version of sacrificing our children. We'll touch on it fairly lightly. I'm just going to give you a little tiny little story is we can sacrifice our children to the world and think we're doing them a service. I had a family when I was a youth pastor at New Covenant. I had 145 young people that I was pastor of. And this family moved from California, and they had a boy and a girl who were in our youth group. And... Um, they claimed to be saved, but I appealed to them because I didn't see any fruit of any kind of godly living or desire to live godly. And so here I am, the youth pastor, and uh, <clears throat> I'm talking to the male about um, his attitudes, about his dedication to the Lord, trying to teach him how to have a quiet time, how to read the Bible, things of this nature, all of which he was very much not interested. Uh, he was a hockey player and apparently very, very good. And um, he was six, 16 years old. And uh, he, he was a very good hockey player. And um, I, I held out for him. I wanted to see this young man come to the Lord. And he was arrogant. He was rude. He was so full of himself uh, because that's what had been pumped into him, into a sport to be bold, aggressive, confident. Well, okay, that's fine. Okay, and everything. But he was losing any kind of sense of godliness to it. So his father came to me and said, we won't be here on Sundays for quite a while. And I said, oh, why is that? He said, because the only time we could get ice time for my son to practice is 4 o'clock in the morning. And I, I just pleaded with him. I said, listen, don't teach your son that it's a good thing to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go practice hockey and then skip the assembly. You're, you're working against what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help this young man. Of course, they blew me off. I kept up with the family. They moved back to California. And I get texts every now and then to pray for the two children who are completely worldly soaked. So be careful how you train your children. I'm not saying anything about sport, but don't sacrifice them to sport, to fashion, to popularity. If you sacrifice them, you're no better than the Canaanites and Egyptians who sacrificed them to the demon god. The demon god of our time has a different face. He's not as scary looking, but the same results. I hope we can remain friends after that. Okay. Um, there was a movie out in the 70s that I used, I'm, the kids must have watched it 30 times, called Chariots of Fire, where Eric Idle, the runner from Britain, refused to run on the Sabbath to teach them there are things more important in life. Go ahead and be an athlete, that's great, but don't sell yourself out to it. You're all staring at me, so I'll keep moving. Why all these laws and restrictions of morality and behavior? So they will not profane the name of the Lord their God, and they may not be judged along with Egypt and Canaan. A twofold thing. With me, I'm holy, and not to incur judgment on yourself by living like an Egyptian or a Canaanite. That's Leviticus 19, 12, 23, 21, 6, and 22, 32. All say the same thing. 
What does it mean to profane the name of God? To make something unholy. It gives God a bad reputation among the Gentiles. And he hates that. He hates that. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation is a complete reversal of the lie that started in the garden about how God is. And God is vindicated in the book of Revelation by destroying the lie and the liar so that the truth remains of who God is. Ezekiel 26, verses 20 through 21, go along with Leviticus. Uh, <clears throat> but when they came to the nations, wherever they came, people were dispersed. At, remember, they were dispersed after the destruction of Jerusalem, 586. So they're all, the Jews are all over the world now. Temples burned. And they're amongst the nations. And God says this about them. They profaned my holy name in that people said of them, these are the people of the Lord. And yet, they had to go out of their land. I had concern for my holy name, says the Lord, which the house of Israel has profaned among the nations in which they came. So here they are, away from the temple, away from their, their community, and so they just began living like an Egyptian or a Canaanite. And God says, I see them. Those are my people. And they profane my name every day. In addition, it's interesting when the Lord teaches us to pray in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. The first thing he tells us to do is to pray for God's holiness. Our Father, which art in heaven, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That phrase there, hallowed be your name in the King James, means make your name holy. That's the first petition that we ask for, is that God's name, how do we keep God's name holy? By living holy lifestyles. And so the nations around say, you're the people of God, aren't you? You're distinct. Why don't you join in with us on this thing? Because I belong to the Lord, and I don't participate in those things. you understand? A distinction in the earth that can be showed by a, a lifestyle instead of being just like the world. Leviticus 18.22, do not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. Okay, so all these sexual things, are, and homosexuality was rampant amongst the Egyptians and Kenites, later on the Greeks and Romans. Rampant and acceptable. Man love, boy love, whatever you want to call it, it makes you all throw up. An abomination is this, ready for the Webster Dictionary, 1828. I always consult that because it was written by Noah Webster, and he's a Christian. And he, he writes his definitions with a, with a biblical perspective. Webster's Dictionary, 1828. You can get it online, and it's really eye-opening. And then the newer versions cut all of his thinking out and still call it Webster's Dictionary. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, abomination, according to Webster's Dictionary, 1828, is repugnantly hateful, detestable, loath loathsome, hated by God. The highest form of insult to the biblical God is an abomination. And so a man lying with another man and the converse of that is included women with women, Romans 1, is an abomination to the Lord. We're taught to tone that down and to say it politely so we don't offend anybody. But you've got to make a choice every day. And it's going to get worse. And you get to live up to the promise that nobody has hanging on their refrigerator. The godly in this life will be persecuted. You, no, anybody have that magnet on the refrigerator? No, it's not a popular one. The word abomination is used five times in Leviticus. In Deuteronomy, 17 times. In the Proverbs, 21 times. In Ezekiel, 43 times, because Ezekiel's prophecy, all 44 chapters, I think it is 44, uh, are about God's glory. He's the prophet of God's glory. And so 43 times he brings up the concept of abomination. That's telling, isn't it? So homosexuality has become the non elect's chief protest against God and biblical order. Understand this. 
It is nothing but sheer, unadulterated, in-your-face rebellion. That's all it is. Don't try to color code it or make it nice. It's full-on rebellion against God and against his biblical order. It is rebellion against the creator, I might add what Bob said, in a very personal way, in its highest form. It's in your face. It's showing contempt for the Lord. Contempt for the Lord is this. I'll do the Italian one, but that's kind of rude. It remains an abomination to God in spite of the modern concept in, in uh, the West of love, tolerance, and acceptance. God fashioned uh, the, the God that they have made of love and tolerance and non-judgment that they have fashioned in the world's image. The God that they worship is not the God of the Bible. The modern God that's presented most regularly on TV and in mega churches and things is not the God of the Bible. They've redefined him how they want him to be. That in itself is close to being an abomination as well. The biblical God still hates the abomination of homosexuality. You need to understand that as, as I mix it up with other evangelicals, and I'm on a little, some, some committees, there are pastors in this community who identify as gay Christians. Big churches. And they're leaving mainstream denominations so they can carry on with their sin. And I'm sitting at a table with cowards, none of which will use the A word. I do, and then I'm kicked off committees. Christian committees. Elders committees. I say, this is an abomination to the Lord. This brother needs to be judged and defrocked. And we need access to his congregation so we can teach them the right things. And I have to leave because they tell me to leave. <laughs> I've been on three committees, kicked off two of them. I'm still on one. Molly says, just, why don't you just adjust your language? I'm not going to do it. I can't. It's not in my personality to do that. I'm not yelling, understand. I'm just bringing them to the word. But they don't want the harshness. Oh, we, can't, we must love this brother. I said, I am loving this brother by telling him the truth. Will you please tell him the truth? <laughs> He's not asking for help. He's asking for, uh, to be accepted and, and a part. And what about my gifts that I can give to God? All that's null and void if you're going to carry on in your sin. All right. So there's less and less and less of us that are holding on to these standards. And so you must pray. Don't pray for the world anymore. Pray for the Christian church. If she doesn't stand up and be what she's supposed to be, I'm telling you right now, the devil will flood the culture like he's doing now. There's nobody to stop him. We're the only bastion of hope with the truth. The church is the pillar and support of the truth. And everybody chooses to believe a lie. Why is it such an abomination to God? It insults him as creator. Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It is rebellion against God's created order. Not only an insult to him personally as the creator, but the order in which he ordained us. So I don't like that. I'd rather be with the male or I'd rather be with the female. Males and females are to remain distinct as God created them because God is distinct from his creation. God is not one with his creation. That's why the world worships the earth because they think God's in the earth. No, God is separate from his creation. He is the holy other. Everybody with me? There is no such thing as mother nature or some other substitute. There's God the creator, his creatures, and his planet. Boom, that's it. And you monkey with that, you're playing Frankenstein. You determine what you're going to be, you determine who lives and dies, all these other kind of things. Not smart for anybody or any government or anybody to become God. Not smart. Because when you make a decision to be a boy or a girl and change your sex or whatever, who's God? 
You are. All right. I'm sorry. This is Leviticus 18, and I get all heated on this. Males and females, are they are created complementary. That is, for procreation. Males, even designed by God. Excuse me, I can't read my own writing. Males were designed by God to provide the seed, and the, and the uh, female was designed to receive the seed of life to conceive another human being made in the image of God. That's God's divine order. Here's a surprise. Ready? This is going to be a surprise to you. You ready? Males with males cannot bring another human into the world. Does that surprise you? Women with women can't bring another human being into the world. Therefore, they're in violation of the divine order. Do you see it? But they're in love. No, they're not. They have believed a lie. That's Romans 1. All right. I'm going to come to a close here before the rocks and tomatoes start coming up the front here. My great-grandpa told me when I was a little boy, I have it. remember, I was six years old when he died. He was a preacher. He said, until they start throwing tomatoes at you, you're not preaching the word of God. Because he used to get regularly pelted with stones and, and tomatoes on the steps of St. Ambrose on the hill where hundreds were being converted and filled the Holy Ghost when he preached. But when we buried him, I was six years old, he had scars on his face from being hit by objects because they protested the truth. St. Ambrose on the hill. Oh, there's a statue of the immigrants out front. But they didn't want God either. All right. How has this escalated in the year 2024? How have we gotten here? It's not hard. It's called the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age is taking advantage of the void created by an impotent church to flood the world with its filth. And until we start preaching the truth, it's only the truth that will set you free. It's not laying on hands. It's not music. It's not a worship band. It's none of those things. It's the truth that will set people free. And so you've got to tell people the truth, even if it costs you a punch in the nose. Let me just do a little juxtaposition with you that I always do. The spirit of the age says this, God is within you. Tony Evans, the guy with too many teeth. The big guy, God is within you. You just have to discover him and find your whole full human potential. Whereas the biblical worldview says this, God is the creator and humans are created. They are creatures. I like R.C. Sproul says, we're nothing more than a bag of dirt. Clay. Everybody all right? And so how can we possibly say to an omnipotent creator, I don't like that you made me a boy. I want to be a girl. And I want to box and hit another girl. My God. Forever distinct creature, creator. Even in heaven, there's only one God. You will not become a God. You will always remain a creature saved from sin. Distinct. Number two, there is no distinction between Male and female. This is the spirit of the age. It's called radical egalitarianism. There is no difference. And so men are encouraged to look for their feminine side. And women are, are said, you can fight in the army too and you become a man until you have to carry a 60-pound rucksack on a 30-mile hike. Then it all shows up. <laughs> there is no distinction, the world says, between male and female. This is what's happening. And to Bob's point, in the public schools, they're encouraging children to not be what God created them to be. They're encouraging rebellion against God to the little children while mom and dad are away. That's what they're doing. We are all one, the Spirit of the Age says, and you can be whatever you want to be. Not true. <laughs> God created some people tall, short, fat, skinny, rich, poor, dumb, educated, tough. That's how it is. Learn to live with that. And don't always dream about being something that you're not. Paul says it this way. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Learn what God, be content with what God's made you. 
Number two uh, thing, the biblical world, male and female are to remain distinct as God is distinct and as he ordained as creator. He remains, they remain distinct in the earth. And we celebrate that distinction. Number three, spirit of the age. Since there's not a personal creator, there are no laws, no boundaries. That's immigration. All these things are are our religious spiritual attitudes. I'm over here. I'm over here. Our religious spiritual attitudes. Okay. They're not just incompetent. They're following the spirit of the age. So the ignoring of our boundaries of our country, which God created, he said where the sea is supposed to start and where it's supposed to stop. They're saying there are, there are no, because there's no personal God. There are no boundaries. Of course, I can't go over to Italy and just walk in. No laws governing sexuality, no taboos. Humans, humans are God and can create their own laws and their own destinies. Hence, the incredible, monstrous emphasis on human rights and global oneness. It's the spirit of the age. This is why when you talk to somebody who's caught by the spirit of the age, Facts are useless because facts are rooted in truth, and there is no truth. It's all wrong. It's, it's truth to you, but I live by this truth. Are you following me? So this is a religious crusade. It is not a political one. In contrast, the biblical worldview is God, God is creator. Uh, all creatures must submit or perish. His word is his law. Obey it and live. Disobey it and die. It's not hard. As God is distinct from his creation, so distinctions are the order of his kingdom. He has outlined the distinct boundaries of the seas and the lands. In Acts 16, I think it is. He told the sea where to stop and for the United States to begin. He's the one. Now, we have wars and then we redraw lines on maps, which is none of our business. And, that, and you can see the problems we have as a result of that. I'm, I'm coming to the close here. Uh, to the world spirit of the age, there is no sin and no need for redemption. Progression and evolution will eventually get us to utopia. Of course, through an all-sovereign government who will lead us and guide us there. That's what's happening. Do you understand? Across the world, we're losing it every day. We're the last bastion on earth. We're the last station on earth and we're about to lose it. Four, uh, the, the God, the, the creator became a creature, took on flesh to forgive us of our utter rebellion against him and uh, you either receive Jesus Christ and live or reject him and you die. Can you get your head around that? The creator became a creature in order to save us. It's incredible, isn't it? But don't ever confuse that. Don't ever mix that. There's only one God-man. His name is Jesus Christ. And it won't be you. You'll be fully in his image, but you'll never be a God. You'll be immortal, but you'll never be eternal. The distinctions will remain. That's why we will still praise him because he's above us. You with me? All right. And then finally, number five. The anthem of the spirit of the age is, I'll do it my way. Sort of a play on Frank Sinatra's fall, song. I did it my way. The world sings, I'll do it my way, not God's way. That's called rebellion. And the anthem of the kingdom of God, if you'll stand with me as we close. Please stand with me. If you know this one, Samuel, if you could throw that up for me. It's an old song we used to sing, and this is the anthem of the kingdom of God which we are, we are God's people. And let's sing this together. Thou art worthy, that's not the right verse. Thou art worthy, 410. Thou art worthy, O God, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, hast all things created, thou hast created all things.